So I'm just going to step right out of the way after introducing Dr. Oralea Mahood. And let's give her a nice Vancouver welcome, eh? Hi, thank you for my Vancouver welcome. I'm actually from Vancouver, so it's kind of fun to be welcomed. <laughs> so that's great. Um, my talk is very much rooted in the classroom, and uh, specifically in my electronic literature class that I taught at Kaplan University last fall. Uh, so it's kind of anecdotal it's the story of what happened to me and my students, of course, the first time I taught a course without a textbook. Uh, a course that had no required materials on sale at the bookstore, uh, a course that pivoted on uh, a freely distributed resource with a Creative Commons um, license. So I think the reason I wanted to come here and tell this story is I was hoping to elicit tales and anecdotes of other people's experience, both as learners and as, as teachers, uh, stories that hopefully would be of a special assistance to those of us who uh, are newly working with um, open educational resources and beginning to create them um, ourselves. So this has been a really kind of provocative and challenging but invigorating few days where I've realized um, how little I know uh, <laughs> and how much I've learned just in, in three days. Uh, so first, a, a backstory, I suppose. Uh, my training is as a literary scholar. Uh, my area is modernism. Uh, so the stories of the small presses and the little magazines central to the rise of, of modernism and specifically its canonization very much figure in my imagination as a reader, as a researcher, and uh, as a teacher. So in particular, I find myself still influenced by writers that I was encountering as a graduate student, so uh, figures like Pierre Bourdieu and John Guillory uh, really shaped my own thinking on modernist literature, that which comes after it, and the processes of canonization. In 1993, John Guillory wrote uh, Cultural Capital, the problem of literary canon formation. And his book relies heavily on Pierre Bourdieu's ideas around uh, the field of cultural production. And he's analyzing the function of schools and teachers in the formation of the literary canon. And he's particularly focusing on the assessment, uh, or sorry, an assessment of the means by which educational systems regulate access to literacy and practices of reading and writing. So of course, this now someone more in a teaching role that's of considerable interest to me. He also spends quite a bit of time emphasizing the necessity of conceptualizing the so social effects of canonization and reasonably argues that canonization and canonicity are not properties of a work but processes tied into transmission. And uh, so of course for someone like myself who's a literary scholar I'm particularly focused on transmission between writers, editors, publishers, literary agents, uh, booksellers, librarians, teachers, the paper makers, so the people down at Hemlock who print beautiful things for us uh, here in, in Vancouver, uh, readers, uh, now all the different kind of online reading groups, so on and so forth. So in my teaching practice, um, I definitely introduce these relationships. And in addition to primary texts, typically have my students uh, reading individuals' authors and manifestos. So if I'm working on Virginia Woolf, we spend a lot of time looking at Woolf's own letters and uh, her essays that she would been writing about the art of reviewing, um, contemporary fiction, those sorts of things. We look at literary criticism, uh, both of the period and uh, more contemporary press releases, look at different editions, look at how the material experience of the text changes the way you receive it. So if you know that James Joyce was absolutely kind of dead set on a certain shade of blue for that first edition of Ulysses, that's quite a different book than your Penguin edition that you found used coffee stain down at McLeod's or something like that. Uh, trips to special collections. So I had this whole kind of teaching practice that was really rooted in paper. <coughs> and I didn't uh, anticipate um, how I was going to feel at sea when all of a sudden I took the paper away. Uh, I knew that these trappings have uh, significant cultural and symbolic value. Uh, but I guess I hadn't thought through my students' own attachment to the paper as well. So in August of last year, so roughly a year ago, I started getting emails from students saying, when are you going to put the book order in? 
and the bookstore says you've forgotten to order the books. And, and so that kind of dialogue starts to emerge. Then it escalates from emails to telephone calls, very panicked telephone. Where, when are the books coming in? School starts in two weeks. Uh, then I actually have physical visits in my office. Uh, I realized, oh gosh, this is going to be a different kind of term. Because already I was beginning that kind of teaching of a different kind of value or, or classroom um, experience. So what I was using um, is something called the Electronic Literature Collection, Volume 1. There's now a Volume 2. You can come into relation with this as a reader in three different ways. Through the freely distributed CD-ROM, the, the ELO, the Electronic Literature Organization, will distribute. You can just go to the web and view it that way, uh, depending on uh, <coughs> what institution you're sitting at, you may or may not be able to open the different digital poems and things. Or the third way you might encounter it is if you were to buy uh, Catherine Hales's book, uh, Electronic Literature, New Horizons for the Literary. So what has neatly happened here is yet another version of the CD-ROM has been packaged with Catherine Hales's book. So depending on how you, as a student, come to the collection, uh, I think different kind of relationships to value or different kind of anxieties around value emerge. My students um, had me give them this CD-ROM in class on the first day. Uh, basically, it was sort of a, a backup in case something happened uh, to their internet service provider or, or what have you. So, you know, there it was. They, they had their hard copy. They couldn't tell me. They weren't able to, to look at it. Uh, what I didn't expect was the amount of resistance they then had to the digital poetry and the electronic literature itself. Uh, in other courses where I've taught contemporary literature that they might find offensive or, or problematic, they still seem willing to buy into its value because vintage or um, <coughs> penguin or a press that they've heard of has taken the time to create the material print object. So they have buy into that consecration. So I find even if I'm teaching something like James Kelman's How Late It Was, How Late, which is written in the Glaswegian demotic and full of words that many of them feel very uncomfortable saying, mm -hmm. uh, so reading it out loud becomes a problem in class, uh, <coughs> they'll, they'll still follow me and I, I can create a relationship, I can create a context in which they're willing to work with Kelman's language experiments and I can talk about it in relation to, to Kafka and how Kelman is interested in looking at bureaucracy as it manifests itself in uh, 20th century Glasgow. But it was a less easy relationship this time around. Somehow, and they are often talked about, well, I didn't have to pay for this. How do I know it's any good? <laughs> uh, <laughs> which I thought was fascinating because you often hear about students wanting their textbook costs to be brought down. So I, I thought I was doing them a great favor. Like, I've, I'm giving you this free course. Uh, but <laughs> this antagonistic relationship emerged. About four weeks into the class, I realized I needed to fix this. That this class was going to, like, we were, like, going off the rails. So I took advantage of the fact that I had been at the uh, Electronic Literature Organization conference um, in Vancouver, Washington in spring of 2008 and just started emailing writers with whom I'd been in conversation at the conference and said, I need help. <laughs> so the result of my plea for help is now archived on <coughs> the uh, WordPress site attached to um, a two-year program at Capilano that looks at culture and technology and this English course is part of that uh, program. So in, in short, I'll just scroll down so you can kind of see what ended up happening. <coughs> I managed to convince J.R. Carpenter, Carpenter, a Montreal-based writer, Donna Leishman from Scotland and Brian Kim Stephens, who's now based down in LA, to be our guest bloggers. <coughs> they all have multiple pieces in the uh, ELC. So what they did was posted an extended meditation on their piece and their practice, which did this glorious job of contextualizing in a way that was far more convincing than if I had done it. 
JR, Donna, and Brian all talked about modernism. They all talked about the Ulipo movement in the 60s. They all talked about sort of um, creating a kind of mechanical or digital data. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, that stuff where Leo was mentioning. Oh, OK, yeah. <laughs> She's not just sort of saying words we've never heard of at the front of the class. Th this is a currency. There's, there's a, a culture of writers out there who are moving into a kind of digital avant-garde. And there's a historical trajectory here. So we would spend an entire class playing with the meditation. Uh, so we would have 90 minutes to work with it. Uh, by the end of the class, it was the students' responsibilities to pose uh, a series of questions. And we'd usually, yeah, we usually limit ourselves to, to three because we thought these people are freely volunteering our time. We can't completely abuse their generosity. And what blew us away was what we got back. All three of these writers probably took at least another hour or two of their time to craft well thought out, really well illustrated answers to all of the questions that the students had posed. So the students were now gobsmacked <laughs> that they had been given these resources, that they were now in dialogue with the writers. And <coughs> all of a sudden, these initial kind of questions about, well, why are we looking at this? How does this fit in? We weren't talking about that anymore. And it just receded into uh, the background in a way that was, I mean, it, this was probably one of the most pleasurable courses I think I've ever taught uh, because we almost fell apart. We collectively figured out how to move forward. And in a way, I didn't realize what I was doing. <laughs> Um, and I didn't realize how much it had in common with the kinds of things that had been talked about for the past three days. So I think just as my students now felt part of a, a community of readers, they kind of understood themselves in relation to that process of, of canonization and, and how their own actions and this archive that we're now leaving up there in the digital space is contributing to the way future readers and other students are going to think about Brian Kim Steffen's work or um, <coughs> JR's work or what have you. So I think for me, yesterday, being at Gardner's talk was really invaluable because it, Gardner's three words that he was uh, emphasizing, particularly near the end of his presentation, I realized encapsulated so nicely what we had accidentally <laughs> done as a group. There had been that opening narration, that opening uh, dialogue, the engagement with the texts. We then went out and talked to our authors. We created a, a kind of curatorial space uh, where those actions could be retained. I'll be able to incorporate them into my electronic literature course uh, this fall that's just a couple of weeks away from starting. Uh, <coughs> We've got new sets of authors who are on board, so we can expand this. Um, so we're working with three new writers this fall. So the sharing is going backwards and forwards. And um, as I say, that I, I have no profound conclusions to offer. I just was really excited about being able to come here and talk about my own initial experience with this. Uh, really excited to hear this next group's stories of their teaching practice and what's going on there, and then hopefully getting a sense of some of the work that other people are doing or ways that we could kind of tweak and refine and, and take this forward. Can I just ask, you said that you plan to incorporate the previous set of student-created materials into your next iteration, do I understand that? Yeah. Other than that alteration on your previous model, do you see yourself making any other, I mean, obviously this structure worked very well for you. Do you see yourself just kind of basically maintaining that essential approach, or are there any other additional tweaks besides the new student? Uh, the other tweak was now that I already had a group of, of readers who had worked with the ELC Volume 1 uh, by a series of polls. Last year, students have determined which writers I should approach to be the guest authors this time. So they had <laughs> real input in terms of, of who we're actually going to be doing this blogging project with. Uh, so that was really nice. And uh, we're going to more formally kind of play with the kind of 
effect of encountering the collection through the three different settings because I hadn't thought that through last time. I hadn't really kind of uh, thought about the teaching opportunity or even the kind of the critical and theoretical implications of these three different venues. Uh, even though perhaps if I was teaching a Joyce class, I would spend so much time on the idea of the addition, I hadn't carried that through into uh, teaching this course. Mm -hmm. um, was there sort of, a, sort of a consideration of the aesthetic of the electronic form at all? That you yeah, absolutely. That factored very heavily into class discussions. Uh, so at the level of the individual works, but at the more pragmatic level of how does the different browser change the way in which uh, a work is viewed. And that was something that a, a lot of the artists, especially Brian Kim Steffens, would bring up uh, the way in which program limitations were changing the perception or experience with his work. So yes, we definitely carried that forward into a, a, a kind of digital analog of, of the pr comparing print editions. Right, which is where that, that backward glancing opportunity became really valuable to, to talk about the history of uh, little magazines and the small presses and the kind of DIY responses to rejection that artists um, historically have repeatedly dealt with. So I, th I think that, um, I think I shied away because it's a 200 level course. Uh, I think that's something else. Uh, now to go back to Brian's question that I've tweaked a little bit more. I'm, I've gone a little more deeply in terms of, of the kind of historical background I'm going to be providing this time around uh, and uh, allowing them to see a, a bigger picture. Yeah, I think there were three students in particular who really em embraced that. And uh, I've seen that picked up in some of their own personal blogging that they're still doing and the way in which they're kind of emerging as advocates of digital poetics. Uh, so I, I think that there seemed to be an opening uh, to see themselves as, as kind of critics or, or advocates in a way that I hadn't noticed uh, in so pronounced a way in, in previous courses. I think initially it was, can we, can we the oh, I'm sorry, uh, Zach was asking um, where was the resistance yeah. coming from and how did I address that? Or how did they accept, accept, how did they accept the, the um, yeah, um, I think this might be too simplistic, but I think in that we are handed textbooks <laughs> from such a young age, uh, all through elementary school and, and so forth, I think Initially, it was simply the expectation that a course should have textbooks. So I think those early emails that I described were the, well, I've never taken a course like this. And remembering we're dealing with second year undergraduates, so they have a limited exposure to different kinds of teaching, probably at that, that stage of the game. So I think it was just a, a safety thing. This isn't what I'm used to. This isn't what I thought I was coming here for. But I think when they arrive in the classroom, saw me kind of shifting, changing how we we're going to do things, got the authors involved, and then they also realized there was still a critical apparatus, there was still secondary readings we were doing, it was just that they were all archived on Moodle, that th as the weeks went by, so probably about week four, week five, I think they realized, oh, this is actually quite hard. <laughs> they somehow equated difficulty and uh, needing to do sustained reading with, oh, okay, this is like other courses I can buy in. <laughs>
sections have some parallel tracks, so perhaps Dr. Wood would be willing to address them in, uh, in the second section. And Duncan, I'm just going to let you introduce your group and get rolling. Sure. Yeah, that sounds good. Hi everyone. Uh, so my name is Duncan McHugh. My name is Duncan McHugh from uh, the Faculty of Land and Food Systems at uh, the University of British Columbia here in town. Uh, because we're in town, we were able to bring our full complement of uh, of um, teaching team members for this course that we're going to be discussing. So, uh, do you guys want to stay there, or do you want to come up, or what do you want to do? Okay. And I'll <laughs> all right. Okay. So, uh, well, I'll let you introduce yourself. So. <laughs> All right, so Catherine Gretzinger is a uh, adjunct professor at the UBC School of Journalism. She's also um, uh, uh, CB, uh, affiliated with the, the CBC, which is the public broadcaster here in Canada. And if you woken up uh, to 6.90 a.m. this last two weeks, you would have heard her voice <laughs> filling in on the morning show. Um, so she um, came over to our faculty uh, for this term to help teach th uh, this course, uh, which was Agro 490, so special topics in agriculture and digital communications, which is very vague, we know. Um, sitting next to her is Cyprian Lomas. He's the director of the Learning Center um, at uh, the Faculty of Land and Food Systems and um, was sort of the, the person that kind of pushed this pilot through to try out these new techniques um, in what in the past has been a pretty standard fourth year seminar, seminar course. And next to him is Andrew Reisman, who is a prof uh, assistant professor, associate professor, sorry. I, these things I don't know. Yeah, you gotta know, yeah. <laughs> um, you have tenure, I know that. Um, uh, he's in the uh, Faculty of Land and Food Systems as well, and he, he was the uh, primary instru or uh, the professor with the course. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, this link right here, uh, we don't. There's no great beautiful blog for this uh, course, um, but I put up a blog entry that has uh, that collects a whole bunch of materials related to this course. So if you follow that URL, it'll take you to this blog, um, and here you'll see links to all of their contact info if you want to talk to them afterwards. Um, also, uh, the presentation is up on SlideShare if you're interested in following there. And then we also have um, both our, our uh, syllabus and grading rubric, um, and a guideline for creating the final podcast that was the big part of this, and um, the full podcast that all of our students did, which would take an hour and uh, there's not enough time for. Okay, so let's get into the presentation. Anything else you'd want to? No, okay. Um, so today our hope is to... Um, uh, talk about how this course came to be, how we, how we, how we did it, uh, what the challenges were, what the results were, and how did openness benefit this course. Um, so to start off, Cyprian's going to discuss just a bit <laughs> about what uh, makes uh, the students in our faculty unique, because they're not necessarily like all other students. And I'm perhaps not the best person as I look at the prof here, but, um, but perhaps by being a bit of an outsider, I can be a little bit more... Uh, uh, candid. Um, our students, I think that often they, um, this might be their second attempt at a degree, so I, I view them as older, more mature, more passionate, more dedicated. Um, I also feel that our faculty is really small and we feel isolated. We're on one corner of the campus. Um, it's it, on a rainy day, it's too far to walk to the sub or the library, so we're off in our own building. And one thing that we found is that while they're really passionate, they really aren't very good at telling stories. Um, the idea that a story has a person, a subject, and, and uh, they're doing something for a reason wasn't entirely obvious to our students. Uh, and so this is one of the things that we worked through, them, through with them. We think that th the Learning Center is really very interested in making sure that our students understand how to communicate better and how to use these tools better. Um, a percentage of our students go on to form NGOs, um, which, is, which is fascinating to me. And to be able to function in this world, I think they need to know how to, how to use blogs, how to use Twitter, how to use Facebook, how to do podcasts, and in particular, how to spread their message. Um, and in the Learning Center, we've tried, to, I should also mention that this is the third attempt at this course. We've been doing this for three years. It changes every year. And I think that I can see two more years um, where we get this right into the central curriculum, I, at least I hope. Podcasting. Yeah. Okay. So just a brief overview of, um, so it, it generally uh, academic podcasting has been um, repurposing of lectures. So there's a recorder in a lecture, prof hits start at the beginning of the lecture, and then at the end hits another button and it gets put up. Um, and this can be useful for students, but it, it sort of just upholds the, the lecture paradigm. And it's not very 
very dynamic. So what um, a few years ago, what a group of people, including Brian, um, on campus tried to do was to create a different form of podcasting on campus. So there was a really cool acronym for that uh, called PEPI, which made us, you know, it was very uh, exhilarating. Um, and so it was a whole bunch of partners on campus that came together to try and form a different type or to kind of have a different type of podcasting on campus. So the School of Journalism and Land and Food Systems um, were going to provide the content. Um, some of the, the central units um, and the library school were going to provide the infrastructure. Um, and the idea was that in addition to having student created um, uh, podcasts that would be a cross campus co collaboration, we'd also um, create an academic iTunes that would be open source and would be different. And uh, there's a, you know, a bit of flying too close to the sun that was way too ambitious. So um, it got scaled back uh, quite dramatically to just um, a collaboration between the School of Journalism and uh, our, our faculty, Land and Food Systems, to create um, podcasts that would use the expertise of storytelling from the School of Journalism and the great content that we have in our faculty, which concerns issues of sustainability, um, you know, local food, food security, water security, all these things that are becoming more and more important uh, these days. Um, Andrew, do you want to talk about the kind of where the course began and how sure. it? Uh, okay. So, Agro 461 is the capstone course uh, for the agroecology students. At this point, we're expecting them to be able to integrate their past three years of, of knowledge and to integrate it and to do something meaningful with that information. Uh, prior to my arrival, it was a very uh, static course. There were still lectures, there were still um, tests, exams, very traditional. And when I became involved in it, I, I have really two main foci uh, that I want my students to do. I want them to do something besides just write another report. And then I want them to be able to communicate what they know and what they feel. If those two things can happen in, in their career, then I think I've done my job. So the first time I, 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 I taught the course was before we got into podcasting, I had them do research projects. And that was fine, but it still ended up with an end product that was a paper on a, on a shelf, that no one interacted with it. It wasn't a living document after they submitted it. So I was starting to talk with Cyprian, he says, well, why don't we do some, some podcasting? And he introduced me to the Pepe group, and the the first year that we did podcasting, we paired agroecology students up with students in the School of Journalism with the thought that the School of Journalism students would be able to bring the, the techniques of storytelling and our students would con uh, contribute the content. Turns out that collaboration didn't work out so well. And in hindsight, we have now discovered that it's much easier to teach the techniques of storytelling than it is to teach content, what the meaningful parts of a story. And so we went uh, a second year in agroecology, uh, 461, and it, it produced reasonable podcasts. We were actually pretty pleased with the end products, but it was still a very cumbersome course. So we eventually partitioned it off into a standalone directed studies course, identified students who really wanted to do this for whatever unknown reason that might be motivating them, and actually some really learned that uh, they got into something that they really did not expect and truly broadened themselves. Um, so we uh, identified Catherine, Catherine, <laughs> Catherine <laughs> as our point person for, for delivering what journalism is, how to be a journalist, the, the philosophy of journalism, the, uh, the, the, the ability to tell a story compellingly, whether it's for a, a journalistic reason or for an advocacy uh, role. And we developed a process that allowed these students to do that. Is there more? <laughs> okay. So my job was to try to provide this framework. So we started out with the basics and um, gave the students a sense of what journalism is. And believe it or not, there is an ethical framework for journalism, even though some things that are passed off as journalism are not. Anyway, there are four pillars to journalism ethics. And we talked to the students about this, and they were terrified. Absolutely terrified. Just the same experience. We don't know this. We don't want to know this. We're afraid of this. This is not our realm. And we said, 
you know, it's okay to be scared. We're going to give you these four pillars and we're going to help to support you to learn how to tell stories within them. So the pillars are truth, fairness, um, making sure that you're accurate in the stories that you tell, independence, so that you're not doing the bidding of somebody else, but that you are going out there and actively seeking out information and then able to analyze that as an independent thinker, not as somebody doing the bidding of another. That you're accountable, which is something that was quite surprising and new to the students. It was really interesting to um, see their feedback because often they would do work and then hand it off and not take responsibility for the end result and we said to them every step of the way if you go out and do this we're going to be asking you questions about it therefore you're accountable for it and that was a big challenge for them and they really liked it um, and then the fourth pillar is minimizing harm so there's no need to go out and cause undue pain and distress for people in the name of journalism. Sometimes it's necessary, especially when you have a politician in the hot seat on the radio in the morning, but uh, mostly it's not. It, it is an, an unnecessary part of, of work. So thinking about minimizing harm and ensuring that our students were very respectful of the stories that they were going out to tell. So those are the pillars that we help them to work on. And then we said to them, we want you to create a story. And we asked them very basic questions. What is a story? And they all knew from English in grade nine that stories have a beginning and a middle and end, and they have characters, and they have scenes, and then they have tension and conflict, and there are other things. And then we said to them, we want you to think about what a story is in an audio sense. So getting them to think about how to use technology, how to go and record and capture scenes with people, have people show them and experience things so that we can, could speak to what Andrew was very curious about, which is how do we get our students to get out there and interact with other human beings in the world, find something out, and then turn around and figure out a way to share it. So that's what we worked on. And one of the tricks that we have at CBC uh, that I spend a lot of my time training people in is focus. Very simple. We have our uh, reporters think about their stories in terms of who's doing what and why. So each story, someone is doing something for a reason. Now it seems very simple, but when you're telling a story about environmental destruction or the development of a farm or something else, the students had to go out and find characters who were making meaningful change in the world and doing things. So it really got them interacting on a whole other level, as opposed to just looking at things on the page and coming up with analysis, meeting people and figuring out how things work for them. So that was sort of my job as we massaged and, and turned these ideas into stories and focus became a, a key part of that. So uh, let's get to some of the early results. So uh, students were sent out um, as kind of an early test uh, or an, just an early experience of using the equipment and also just putting themselves out there where would they have to go out and interview people um, to do a streeter, uh, which is called a streeter, or like person on the street interview. So uh, I'll just play you one of those. And we didn't really give them much guidelines. Ma mainly it was just to get them familiar and comfortable with using the equipment and, and the techniques. And so um, let's just make sure this... Is that, uh, is that loud enough? Or, well, we'll find out. Um, so uh, we sent out one of our students and she created, uh, a, well, you'll, you'll hear, she made something. So today is International Thank a Farmer Day. And it came about because farmers around the world are quite undervalued nowadays and most people are forgetting about them. So if you could say anything to a farmer, what would you say? Thanks for quiet places. Thank you, Strawberry Farmers of Ontario. I'm from Ontario, and I dated a strawberry farmer, and they're very hard workers. I'd like to thank the farmers who grow vegetables when I'm vegan. I think that's really great. Yeah, I think that farmers allow us to have the, the lifestyle that we have so that we can do the things that we value. Thanks for being the people who grow our food, and uh, I don't know, it's the most important thing that we need besides, well, food and shelter and water, so... Um, that's what I would thank them for. I think all farmers around the world would, would share the same qualities of hardworking and uh, you know, determined and uh, very uh, aware of their goal and how they can uh, achieve it. 
So that, that was uh, how things started off. And I mean, already students were out in the world and uh, talking to people about these issues and getting out of the classroom. Um, so back to the slideshow. Um, and so they also um, were asked before they did their final podcast to do a, a what's known as a voicer, which is kind of a simple news story that's about a one or two minutes long and uh, incorporates narration, sound effects, creating um, mood with sound and, um, and, and working in together interviews. Um, so a few of the tech, uh, tech workshops, I figured you guys might be interested in these, um, that we had to give them. Uh, the first one uh, was copyright awareness. A lot of students have no idea about copyright um, using, w I mean, we weren't using too many images in this, but we have similar courses and, and students there as well have no idea about um, what's okay to use um, image-wise, where to get video or music when they need it for their presentations if they're going to go online, or at all, but especially if they're going online. Um, so just um, informing students about, about copyrights and what, what they can and can't do, and also about alternative licenses like Creative Commons. Um, and students, yeah, were, were blown away. They had no idea about any of this. Um, we also uh, t gave some workshops on how to get a good recording, how to use audio recorders, and basic audio editing so that they could um, figure out how to do this. Um, in terms of tools, uh, we used open source tools. So um, we used Sakai to communicate with the students and also for them to uh, submit their work. But the big uh, tool that we used was Audacity. So are, are any of you familiar with Audacity? A bunch of you. So it's a free um, open source cross-platform audio editor and it, it, it's, it's buggy. It doesn't always work. You have to save often. I know um, I also work at the School of Journalism a bit and I get lots of very distressed phone calls from thesis students who uh, have to export something from Audacity. But it is a fantastic tool for, um, for a beginning, um, for a beginner kind of audio editor. So students can download this on their home computers. They don't need to come into our lab to be able to do it. And they're going to be able to continue to use Audacity after, they leave the, or after they're done with the course and leave the university. So these are skills that, th that they're going to be able to take with them and uh, they won't have to just abandon once they get away from the hardware and uh, licensed software that we have. So we thought that was important too. Um, final, do you guys want to talk about the final piece? Or should we just play a clip? We've <laughs> seven minutes left. Okay, so maybe I'll just play a clip. Um, so a couple of things. Um, we asked students to submit 10-minute uh, audio pieces. Um, they were workshopped extens extensively, so students had to bring in um, outlines, scripts, and um, and also uh, uh, clips of, of, of what they had recorded. And it really instilled in them that they have to be accountable for what they're doing, and that you know, this isn't just a paper that they're going to submit and only their prof is going to read. They are the ones that are, have to stand behind this and that people are going to hear it. Um, so I think they, they, the students really stepped up when they knew that they had to do this. This wasn't just another uh, assignment. Um, students in their reflections spoke about not being able to get to sleep at night, which was not what we wanted, but they were like constantly obsessed with making sure that they got this right. And there would be little things that would just keep them up at night because they, they were really intent on getting this perfect. Um, students also um, submitted to a C the, <laughs> the CBC competition. Any, any word on those? a journalism competition for students um, that happens every year and we said to them because you're operating under journalistic parameters for this piece why don't you go ahead and submit and that contest became such a focus for these students so uh, at the beginning of the semester they just were pushing back on this and by the end they had been won over and I think it was because they really liked the power of telling their own stories which is what we're seeing in in journalism right now bloggers are gaining as much credibility and influence as as others so we said to these students you are now citizen journalists so go out there and act like it and see what you can come up with and they did take it seriously and some of them were considered right up to the very end so we might have just won an award just squeaked asked us. Okay. Do you want to give a brief uh, just description of the tough to graph, uh, Alicia, and what it was like? <laughs> <laughs> just very briefly, though, and I'll play a clip. Of I was listening to you uh, describing students and the fear factor and then the withdrawal part of, and we had Alicia in our classroom who literally sat like this for the first two months of the course. She would sit there, and if she wasn't looking like this, she would look like this. <laughs> and be raking her, her hand through her hair and we could never get a read on her and we didn't know. And what happened was she was going through this monumental shift in her head because she is in love with soil. 
this young woman. She knows more about soil than anyone I've ever had the privilege of meeting. And she cares very deeply about it. And she felt so isolated in this passion she had for soil. Her family didn't understand, her friends didn't understand, even her fellow students. This podcast and the tools that she was able to develop along the way opened her up and allowed her to be able to communicate in a meaningful way why this was important to her. And she's gone on, she's doing all kinds of projects with sound now. But uh, I think you're going to hear a bit of, bit of her piece. Yeah. So the, the full 10 minute um, podcast is available online, but we'll just play the first uh, minute or so now, just so you get a sense of what she came up with. Soil. It's easy to take for granted. It's almost everywhere you look. It literally comes with the territory when you buy property. As we speak, soil is being swallowed by the ocean, blown away by the wind, and paved over by concrete. It needs to be protected. I witnessed this firsthand. The land beside my grandparents was purchased for development. Bulldozers stripped the land, desecrating the topsoil. And when the dust finally settled, they unrolled lush sod, red carpet to their beachfront property total disrespect for the native soil. Immersed in the city, we often overlook the potential of the soil that's already there. If it's not on a farm, it must not be good for growing. When I see raised beds at community gardens, I always wonder, did they even bother with the native soil? At the future site of the City Hall Community Garden, I met up with Melissa Iverson, master's candidate at UBC. She worked... Um, we're really short on time, so I, I'm going to cut it off there, but I... Yeah. Um, we do have time for a few questions, and I've been ordered by the people who are remotely dealing that I should bring you the microphone if you do have a question. What the person on the other end of the <laughs> entire room? Hi, um, it's just a comment. Uh, I've been involved with a community radio project uh, working with the Commonwealth of Learning and I'm struck by how similar the experiences that you guys are having here in the developed world are similar with what's going on in the developing world. And wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a way to share these stories and good practices across those boundaries so we can all learn from each other. Thanks. Do you guys have any final comments? I'll, I'll yeah, yeah. say something. <laughs> uh, in, in building on Alicia's experience, she had two barriers. One was that she was a very good student who always got A's. And she did that by writing reports, and she felt very comfortable doing that. And so when we're telling her that your written word isn't what this final product is, that was a real barrier for her. And then the second part was that we kept telling her that a story is someone doing something for a reason. And she couldn't figure out who was passionate enough for her to tell that story. And it only clicked when we said, well, you can be that person. And she assumed that responsibility and, and she just flew. It seems to me that all of our students were scared, but they all ro rose to the challenge. To, you set the bar, the students will do it. Our final comment is that in terms of openness, we just took it for granted that right from the beginning we, we were going to concentrate on students and we were going to talk about Creative Commons and, and essentially open the whole way through. I find that if you look at the faculty, it's a lot, uh, this is what I will use as the example to go to our faculty members because, the, um, because there's just not a lot of awareness of everything that open or open educational resources means, I think. Um, I think we're at, at time, and I think we might as well wrap it here. I really want to give some serious kudos to everyone here today for taking the graveyard slot and actually bringing it to life. And I want to thank all of you for sticking to the bitter end. I hope this was a good event for you. And let's give our, a good hand for our fantastic presenters.